This is Beekeeper Confidential, a show about the curious lives of bees and their beekeepers. I'm your host, Mandy Shaw. Today is Beekeeper Confidential's one year anniversary. That's right, it has been a full year of interviews with amazing guests. And today's episode is about the journey that has brought this show where it is today, and we'll be including listener questions and answers. This show has evolved since the first episode, but the core message remains the same. Stories about bees and their beekeepers. We've heard from urban beekeepers, commercial beekeepers, bee advocates, authors, scientists, bee removal experts... You've all been along for the ride for my different intro music choices and sound effects. You've heard recordings that have been taken in my kitchen pantry, my art studio, my living room, different apiaries and backyards, and even the library. Now here are some statistics for you. As of today, Beekeeper Confidential has had over 35,000 downloads. We have listeners from all over the globe. The majority of our episodes have been downloaded in the United States, followed by Canada, and then Australia and the UK. But we even have listeners in Ireland, New Zealand, South Africa, Hong Kong, Latvia, Jamaica, Mexico. There's more than that, but you get my point. Together, we have cultivated a global community that values the stories of fellow beekeepers. Over the past year, I've been the recipient of generous patron support that has allowed me to upgrade my recording equipment, pay for my podcast hosting service, buy batteries and SD cards, I was able to purchase a camera to make films for my YouTube channel, and the most recent upgrade is a website for Beekeeper Confidential to call its very own. Check it out at beekeeperconfidential.com. And if you want to become a patron of this show, you can visit patreon.com forward slash Mandy Shaw. Producing this podcast is delightful and challenging, and I sincerely thank you all for being a part of it. Now, here's a weird story. Early on, when I was just learning how to do sound editing, I was sitting in the waiting room at the Toyota dealership waiting for my bee van to get serviced. I had my laptop with me and I was trying to edit one of the episodes that I had recorded. I had yet to publish anything and I was totally fumbling and struggling with how to even go about this whole editing thing. So there I was, headphones in, nose down, concentrating hard. And this guy comes up and asks if he could sit next to me. And I'm like, okay. So he sits and I continue working. But from the corner of my eye, I can tell that he's looking at my screen. So I look up at him like, what? And he says, oh, you're a sound person. So I explain to him, I'm starting a podcast. I'm learning how to edit. And I'm really new to all of this. So it's taking a while. Well, it turns into this whole conversation about how he is a sound producer who has worked on some Hollywood films. Now, I looked into his claims and they check out he is legit. And he tells me that I should just send him my audio file and he'll help me out for free. For the bees, of course. And as a person who likes to do things themselves, even if it's really hard, I was really reluctant to accept his help, but he insisted. He assured me he was happy to do it and it wasn't a problem. So we exchanged cards and I was starting to have that feeling that you get, you know, when stars align and you know you're on the right path and things are working out just perfectly. It was like the universe was giving me exactly what I needed. What are the odds my brand new podcast being edited by a Hollywood sound producer? So later that day, he texted and emailed me, reminding me to send him the file. So I sent it to him. 
and he calls me about an hour later and tells me how terrible the recording is. And he goes into this 30 minute rant about the technicalities of why it was so bad and how it would just take him too long to fix and he would have to charge me for it. And I should just record all of my episodes at his house in his recording studio. And now all the red flags are up. I understand the critique that he gave. I'm actually glad for it because it really forced me to look at how I should be getting the audio in the first place and how I can smooth out the ambient noises, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there was no way in hell that I was going to allow myself to be under somebody else's thumb and get sucked into being dependent or potentially victimized by this guy. So I did more studying and I found some tricks to improve the audio. I worked on getting better recordings. And if you've listened to the show from the beginning, you can hear the progression of audio quality over the past year. So while it was a totally weird experience with this guy who still calls me from time to time, um, ultimately it made me a better producer because it stoked that whole screw you, I can do this really well without your help, fire in my heart. And for those of you who know me personally, you know that my mom has always called me her trial by fire kid because I just jump right in. And this leads me to a listener question from Kate who asks for tips on starting a podcast. I would recommend starting with a clear purpose for your show Come up with a really good name. Get a decent recording device. I use a Zoom 4HN Pro. Get some good microphones. Get some sound editing software. I use Audacity, which is free, and there are a ton of YouTube tutorials on how to use it. And then decide on a podcast hosting service, such as Podbean. Just jump into it and have fun but be realistic about what you can handle. When I first started the show, my goal was to produce an episode each week, and I quickly realized that I couldn't deliver on that and adjusted to an episode every two weeks. That gives me just enough of a break between editing and recording episodes. Um, earlier this year, I did try to throw in mini episodes between full ones, and it was just really hard for me to keep up with the avalanche of B season and then my kids being on summer vacation. So for now, I'm sticking with full episodes every two weeks. Listeners at Fair Apis and Adrian Smith want to know when and how and why I got into bees in apiculture. So I was in a transitional stage in life. I was depressed. I had been laid off from a full-time job working as a financial services officer at a college, and I was really struggling with suddenly becoming a stay-at-home mom to my two toddler boys. I was going completely stir-crazy with day-after-day juice boxes and goldfish crackers and baby cartoons, potty training, tantrums and play dates and miss nap times and all the things that go with being a stay-at-home parent to really young kids. It was hard and it was extremely isolating, but mostly I felt that I had lost my independence. And one night, I was watching a documentary called More Than Honey, and I felt a spark of inspiration. So I started reading about bees and beekeeping and pollinator gardens, and I took a class on mason beekeeping and started keeping those, but my desire to work with bees was growing, and I needed more bees so I continued studying honey beekeeping. And then on a sunny day in May of 2015, a beautiful swarm landed in a tree in my front yard. I mean, I, I could not believe it, but I didn't have any equipment or hives ready. So I called the local swarm hotline and this total tough guy beekeeper named Elliot came and got them. 
after that, I kicked my studies into high gear and I got really serious about what I needed to do to get honeybees. And the following spring, I got my first hives. And it's so strange because now, years later, I'm the president of the beekeeping association that Elliot is a member of, and I still see him every month at the meetings. Apiculture has given me a path that allows me to engage with the community in a way that nothing else ever has. I have found my voice. I have been able to build a business of my own that gives me the flexibility that I need so that I can still be available to my family, but also earn some income and keep busy each day and feel like I'm doing something that really is making a difference. And apiculture has also led me to producing this podcast. So in celebration of today's milestone, I asked my listeners some questions on Instagram. I started with the generic, how many times have you been stung question, and here are some of the answers. And I'm sorry in advance if I produce any of these screen names wrong, but I'm going to try. At Najarona, <laughs> did I say that right? Um, their response is, this year? At Suedo Amazon from the Social Work of Social Insects episode says, ha, I got swarmed that one time, so who knows? At Pollinators and Petals says somewhere around 30 times. At Fair Apis, 20 at least. At Ballerina Bees, six times. The first couple weren't bad, and then I got three at the same time and had to go to the ER. Got me right in a vein. Ouch. <laughs> At Missy B. Lee, she takes the trophy here with a whopping 545 stings. Oh. <laughs> At Boise Farmhouse, can't count anymore. At Chris Starkus, 15 to 20. And at Kitson Rune CX. <laughs> Sorry, I know I said that wrong. Um, their response is four times. So now it's my turn to share. I've been stung about 15 times. Uh, half of those have been this year. I also wanted to hear about their sweetest bee memories. At Palm Pike's memory was watching a queen come back from her mating flight for the first time. Uh, I have yet to see that happen, but that must have been completely magical. At Suedo Amazon said that her sweetest memory was picking up her first bees and loving them so much and not knowing what she was in for. Now, if you listened to the episode featuring at Suedo Amazon, a.k.a. Rachel Ferris. She's in the social work of social insects episode. And in that episode, she describes an incident where she is moving a hive with her mentor and the hive tipped over in the truck on their way to their new destination and how they just they kept driving and because they didn't want to deal with that in the middle of somebody's neighborhood. So they drove to where they needed to be and just put the hive box back together and got the bees moved into their spot. And she got stung a ton of times. <laughs> um, but it makes for a great story. My sweetest bee memory was earlier this year, I had just finished recording the episode with Dr. Samuel Ramsey, and I got a phone call while I was recording that interview with him, and the people left a message about a swarm, and it was really close to where I lived, and it was in a park, and it was an area where I know that there are bee trees, so that made it a great score, but it was my first time catching a swarm with my bare hands. It was totally exhilarating and probably the highlight of my beekeeping career to date. I felt like it was a really huge milestone for me to be able to be hands-on like that. I just had my street clothes and my veil and 
just went in there and did it. And I made a video of it. And you can see that on the Beekeeper Confidential YouTube channel. During this last swarm season, I got a message from someone who heard me talking about bees on the Allergies podcast. And she lives in the area and she wanted me to know that there was a swarm on one of the mile marker posts along a Highway 205 near West Lynn. And she said she was positive it was a swarm and that it was about the size of a football and it was just there on the side of the road and she spotted it while sitting in traffic. So I decided to take the risk and see if I could find it. I was really, really hopeful and feeling super buzzed from all the adrenaline and it was like the closer I got to that location, the harder my heart pounded. And she had given me a pretty exact uh, location, but by the time that I got there, the bees were gone. <laughs> um, it was a pretty big letdown. And I usually won't go on a swarm catch without photo proof that the bees are there and that they are, in fact, honeybees. But this time I decided to go just because it would have been so cool had it worked out. Bee work. It comes with so many opportunities, but if the timing is just off by a little, those opportunities can be completely missed. But when things are in sync, it's such a beautiful feeling. Bee work also comes with bloopers. Lots and lots of bloopers. Here are some from our Instagram community. At Hello Be The Wing writes, I almost passed out once from lifting a heavy super in high temps. Oh, um, I hear you. I nearly got heat stroke once while doing a swarm catch in 100 plus degree temperatures in the full sun. I was wearing my bee suit, my leather gloves, my rubber boots, my veil. Um, I think it was maybe my second year beekeeping and I was still pretty scared. So I was fully suited up and it was scary. <laughs> At Ballerina Bees writes, the first time I spotted my one queen, she flew off of the frame. I forgot that bees had wings. Oh, I had a queen fly off at the end of a swarm catch. I had gotten all the bees in a cardboard box and I was getting ready to close the lid and I saw the queen walking on the cardboard flap and I had a couple of people with me and so I had her walk onto my finger and I said, look, here's the queen and then she flew off and we never found her. It was hugely embarrassing and devastating and I felt like the worst beekeeper ever. At Sipping on Chamomile shares that summer beekeeping is all fun and games and bikinis until your partner drops a frame. Womp womp. I wear a bikini under my bee suit, but I'm really working on getting more brave with my bees because wearing that bee suit is hot no matter what you've got on underneath. But the thought of being in a bikini and a frame of bees dropping on the ground, that does not sound fun. <laughs> um, here are some listener questions. Jamie Jewell writes, I seem to see more of a community effort to save the bees. Is it having an impact? Are people making a difference? What else can we do? So community involvement can definitely turn into broader involvement from city and state governments in terms of pesticide use or non-use. If everyone planted more pollinator-friendly plants and stopped using chemical pesticides and herbicides, it would have a huge positive impact on insect and bird populations. Ruby Reed wants to know, what is your favorite thing about doing this podcast and what are you most proud of? Um... I honestly love producing something that people find entertaining and informational. I love getting connected to new people and basically growing my community of beekeeper friends by talking to all these amazing guests and connecting with listeners. And I'm really very proud that I went through with my idea to make this show 
I hesitated for a good four or five months before actually doing it. And when I first started, it looked like such a mountain. The idea of, you know, producing the shows, my goal was to do it for a full year. And now that I've reached that mark, I look back and I'm just, I'm very proud of this body of work that I've created and, and have been able to share with the world. Uh, Dr. Andoni Melithopoulos from the Pollen Nation podcast wants to know which guests I would seat beside each other for dinner. Oh my God. So <laughs> I had to actually write all of the guest names on cards and shuffle them around to come up with this because I really had to stop and think. A beekeeper confidential dinner party would first be held at the Nectar Creek Tasting Room and guests Wei Chow and Ken Matley, who happen to be friends of mine, they would be together and they'd be laughing about how Ken sold Wei some ware hives right before I was about to buy them. And he sold them to Wei for $100 and then Wei found out that I had wanted them he turned around and sold them to me for a hundred dollars and a swarm, which I've yet to deliver. Hillary Kearney and Byron the Bee Man would be seated together. Then Sam Comfort and Bill Catherall, they'd be talking about treatment-free beekeeping. Jasmine Joy and Mihail Tile, Rachel Ferris and Thor Hansen would be playing Celebrity Bee Mashup. Fanta Monolo and Tuck of Seville would be deep in discussion about queens. Kyle Mayo and David Bach. And then Cynthia Holt and Isabel Rommel. And B-Man Dan with Officer Darren Mays. Stephanie Pullen with Jake Pullen because they're in love. Uh, Scott Langlace and Rex McIntyre. Debbie Thomas with Rex Robertson. Dr. Thomas Seeley with Ruby Reed, Angela Roll and Lois Levine, and then Tim Wessels and Dr. Ramsey would be completely geeking out on bee science. And behind the bar would be your host, along with Nick Lorenz, who is the co-founder of Nectar Creek. Uh, we would be working and pouring meads for all of the guests. Uh, Bonnie Dutch wants to know, if you could write an animated B movie, what would the title be? Well, Bonnie, that's a great question. I would actually write a series of animated B movies. Uh, it would be the Pollen Brigade Chronicles, and the first film would be Good to the Last Drop. Bonnie also wants to know what my hardest interview has been and what my most delightful interview has been. That's a really difficult question to answer because all of my guests have been so interesting and incredible to talk with, but probably as far as difficulty goes, I'd have to go with difficulty in editing. And the episode where I spoke with Stephanie and Jake Pollan from Zane and James Apiary was a really hard episode to edit because at the time I was recording all of my phone interviews by just putting them on speakerphone and having my recorder out in the room. And I was on speakerphone and they were on speakerphone and we didn't have a really good connection. And so that made it very difficult to smooth out ambient sounds, to have the right amount of treble and bass. So I ended up calling my friend Max, who who filmed the Swarm Chaser movie that we did together. And I said, can you help me? I'm not sure how to fix this. So he helped me improve the, the sound on that. Um, so yeah, that was definitely the hardest one. Um, the most delightful interview, I would have to say the discussion with Dr. Samuel Ramsey. I had planned ahead of time that I would try to get him to sing that Hey Varroa song with me. And I kind of waited towards the end of the interview. I felt like he would totally be down. Once I had a, you know, a conversation with him and, and got to know him a little bit better, I was like, I think he's going to do it. So I'm just going to 
be a total dork and put myself out there and start singing the song about Varroa mites. And it was so funny. I mean, I, I just, I felt like, you know, doing cartwheels because he went for it and we laughed and we had a good time. And that's, that's really what I want out of this show is just, let's talk about these hard issues, but let's also have a good time while we're doing it. Uh, Mike Clem, who is also a longtime patron of the show and supporter, he sent in some questions and he wants to know what advice would you share with your new beak self? Uh, <laughs> I, I guess I would say, Mandy, you got this. Don't be afraid. Follow your intuition. Just take a deep breath and enjoy the experiences that are about to unfold. Mike also wants to know, what are the three biggest mistakes that new beaks make? I would say being afraid of their bees. And that's something that actually prevents them from getting in there and and taking care of some of the important management things that they need to be taking care of. A second thing would be assuming that their hive doesn't have mites simply because they haven't seen any. And as we know, Visual inspections are not enough of a Varroa management strategy. And then probably the third mistake would be not having an understanding of nectar flows and dearths and how deeply those impact what the colony can or cannot do as a result. For example, somebody recently asked me if they should put a super on their hive now. So where I live, the nectar flow has been done for almost two months and we're not going to have another one. So there's no way that a colony could build new wax and fill it up with nectar. Um, so that's just that's one of those examples of understanding nectar flow and, and dearth. Um, and his third question is, can a new beak get into their hive and inspect it too often in their first year? Yes and no. Uh, getting into the hive regularly definitely gives you the hands-on experience that you need as a new beekeeper, but it comes at the cost of colony health. You know, every time you open your hive, it sets them back a bit. In my first year, I was on a schedule where I would inspect like every 10 to 14 days. I wasn't doing regular mite checks despite the fact that I was opening my hives all the time and my bees suffered because of it. So now, on average, I open the hives about once a month and when I go in, I know exactly what I need to do I'm quick about it. I get in, I get what I need to be able to assess their strength and health, and then I close them back up. So I think knowing what you need to do when you inspect makes a huge difference. Um, and you can ask yourself, is this a productive inspection or is it a fun inspection just so I can hang out with my bees and look for the queen? Sharon Schmidt wants to know, who really has had success stopping robbing once it started? Um, that's tough. I mean, I haven't really. I recently had a little tiny hive get robbed out and there were thousands of robber bees in my backyard apiary. I couldn't tell for sure if they were my own bees or if they were coming from a neighboring hive, but they were trying to get into all of the hives. They were going at the bait hives and it was one of those situations that was really on the verge of being totally out of control. They were flying all over my neighbor's yard. They were flying in my neighbor's driveway. Luckily, my neighbor is fine about all of it, but I had all of the beehives' entrances reduced. I had put a wet sheet over the hive that was the main target of the robbers. I ran the sprinklers. Um, none of that stopped them. And they were back the next day and I caught it early enough that I, you know, that it hadn't escalated to the point where it had the day before. Um, and I ended up just moving the hive that was being robbed out and just closing it off completely because I could tell it was a goner. The bottom board was a sea of bee parts and torn cappings. And there, there's just no way that they would have survived that. 
Julie Wasserman writes, what topics will you be covering at your workshop on October 19th? Can't wait. So yeah, I am teaching a workshop on October 19th here in Portland. It's the first class in my four-part series on holistic apiary management. Um, So Julie, I'm going to be discussing honeybee biology, hive styles, where to source your bees, pests and diseases to look out for, and what to expect during those first hive inspections. So if you're getting into bees this upcoming spring, or if you're an existing beekeeper that needs a refresher on basics, this is a really great class to start with. The remaining three workshops will focus on seasonal management techniques, and those are going to take place in spring, summer, and fall. So if you're in the area and you wish to attend, visit waggleworkspdx.com. Registration is $40. It includes food and beverages from Urban Farm Foods, and it's being held at a venue called Tendu, and it's this really gorgeous event space. It's inside of the Ford building in Southeast Portland. And I tell you what, it is going to be the swankiest beekeeping class I've ever taught. And I'm really excited for it. Um, Unfortunately, I only have space for 20 students. So if you plan on attending, get your tickets now because they will sell out. The class is a little over a month away and I've already sold half the tickets. So I hope to see you there. Okay, beekeepers, that is the show for today. Thank you all for listening. And be sure to check out our new website, beekeeperconfidential.com, and send in your questions, comments, or requests for guests. I've also created a community forum page on the website for us to talk about the episodes and bees and beekeeping and further connect with each other. So I hope to see you all there. Until next time, may the buzz be with you. Confidential is a Waggle Works production and is written and produced by Mandy Shaw.